I didn't shake anyone's hands because my palms were dripping. I was nervous. Joining a new club is always daunting, but cultural clubs have their own special expectations. You didn't have to be Filipino to join. Technically, anyone with a global curiosity could, but everyone really was. I walked into the giant auditorium where hundreds of past and future members mingled like one big family reunion. In fact, families, or subgroups within the club, were being assigned that day, and auditions for Kaba Bayan's renowned dance crew, Kaba Modern, were being held the next week. People were yelling across the room at old friends, playfully quarreling like cuyas and ates, and I floated into a circle of girls talking about their recent debuts. Oh my god, your dress was so pretty, one said to another who was scrolling through pictures. Yeah, but I wish I'd picked different people for my court. All my friends flaked on the practices. When their attention turned to me, I had to admit that I never attended one, nor had my own, and they were in disbelief. Oh great, I thought. I'm the weirdo who never came of age. <laughs> another girl asked me which brand of papaya soap I'd used to lighten my skin and I wasn't sure if I should be flattered or insulted. And then some guy said something to me in Tagalog, and I did that blank-eyed nod smile. You know, the universal sign for I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> I'll always remember the way he laughed and walked away. I'd assumed that I'd fall into an automatic kinship with these people, these people who look just like me, but that didn't happen. It was like walking into a welcome home party where no one really missed you. What I thought was going to be this warm communal embrace ended up being nothing more than an indifferent shrug. So I went to a couple more meetings and then I quit the club. Looking back, it was my fault for not sticking it out. Most of the people had been friendly, but my own discomfort prevented me from giving them a chance. How had I become so distanced from my family's roots? Why had I felt so lost when I thought I'd feel found? My grandparents came to the States when they were 18 and 19. They went to college here, got married here, and decided that assimilating into American culture would make life easier for their kids. So lunch was white bread sandwiches, no rice soaked in sinigang or adobo with its telltale smell of vinegar wafting through the air. Clothing was the baby bloomer uniform, itchy homemade polyester suits and blue jeans, not the pastoral look of the Barong Tagalog or Barot Saya. There were sinales, sure, but only because they had an American doppelganger, the flip-flop. And to my parents, Tagalog was never taught and rarely spoken. To me, Tagalog sounds like a fumbling alphabet playing a clumsy soccer game, where consonants cut each other off and vowels run parallel to other vowels. Like the belly roll of an exotic dancer, words undulate, starting at the back of the throat and swelling, spilling over the teeth. It's a collection of click clacks with a tap dancer for a tongue. And the contradictions, it's discordant yet melodious staunch, yet flittering and delicate. Tagalog is like poetry to me, uh, mostly in the sense that I don't understand either. <laughs> but above all, it has identity and familiarity in culture, something that, as a third-generation Filipina-American, I deeply, deeply desired. I myself have always been a bit contradictory, trying on identities to see what fits best, like everybody. As a kid, I spoke mangled Spanglish, went to dozens of quinceañeras, and bartered for spicy tamarind candy with the exotic rice candies that my mom bought me. As a teen, I snuck out to post-punk concerts, joined the art and design program to my mom's dismay, and even tried to learn how to surf, despite not knowing how to swim. <laughs> there are some things you can never shed, though. I can never shed my father's absence or my mother's reservations, the blind pride of my grandparents, or vestiges of the motherland wrapped in red, white, and blue. In my family, everything was about academic pursuit. Academic pursuit equaled professional success, professional success equaled financial stability, and financial stability was the end-all be-all for people like my grandparents who came from poverty. Their stories are Dickensian tales where they were orphaned and abandoned and forced to share rooms with their eight to 10 siblings, so I understand their intentions. They were being practical. Their upbringings had taught them as much. But opportunity is a word that rings like tinnitus in the ear of every made in America child. Opportunity left me with the charge of reconciling my own identity in all of that duality. I had to figure out what being Filipina American, what that hyphen meant to me, not to my classmates, not to the club members, and not even to my family, just me. 
There was never one big epiphany in all this, though. Life isn't that simple. It's more of a gradual succession of mini epiphanies, like packing Bailik Bayan boxes every Christmas with clothes and canned coffee and spam, even though I never met the relatives we're sending them to, or writing letters to my cousin Karen in Kalashau, Pangasinan, or learning how to cook cassava cake and pancit palabo from my strong, feisty grandma who lost so much as a child that she consequently believes she has to fight for everything. It's the fact that my grandpa was the only one of 10 siblings to come to the US to get an education, which allowed me to go to college and discover Kababayan in the first place. And maybe, most importantly, it was learning to appreciate the complexity of my own narrative, so that one day, hopefully, my own kids will feel at home no matter where they go. Thank you.